Police in Tokyo have detected a tiny amount of radiation from the drone found on the roof of the Prime Minister's office. They say the radiation level is not harmful. Shinzo Abe was not in the building as he is in Jakarta. Investigators say the small drone was carrying a container filled with liquid and marked with a radiation warning symbol. They believe it contains radioactive cesium. They say there was also a miniature camera attached. They're trying to find out who flew the drone and how it got to the prime minister's office. The unmanned aircraft is currently under examination at the police bomb disposal unit. A senior government official says it's not clear whether the incident is linked to terrorism. A staff member found the drone at around 10.30 a.m. on Wednesday and alerted police. Japan does not have regulations for flying drones at low altitudes. Japanese courts are making decisions about the operation of nuclear reactors in the country. A court in central Japan last week blocked the restart of reactors there. But in southern Japan, a court is allowing a restart to proceed. The lawyer for residents opposed to the restart says they are disappointed. The Kagoshima District Court sided with the operator of the plant. The presiding judge said the reactors at the Sendai nuclear plant are able to withstand earthquakes at currently predicted levels. He also said the possibility of a major volcanic eruption is extremely unlikely. Officials with Kyushu Electric Power Company say they will proceed with the restart of the two reactors. They say they want them back online as early as July. The Nuclear Regulation Authority had already approved the restart last September. The regulator had also approved the resumption of reactors at the Takahama nuclear plant in central Japan. But last week, a court there blocked the restart. All of Japan's 48 nuclear reactors are currently offline. The Abe administration wants those approved by the regulator to resume operation. The people in charge of a nuclear plant in southwestern Japan have been working to get one of the reactors back online, but they say they've had to push back the timetable for restarting the number one reactor at the Sendai plant. Officials with Kyushu Electric Power Companies had been planning to restart the reactor in early July, and now they are aiming for the middle of July. They submitted the new schedule to the Nuclear Regulation Authority. Regulators began inspecting the number one reactor last month in preparation for the restart, but the process had fallen behind schedule. Kyushu Electric officials have told regulators that they don't have all the necessary documentation. And there could be a further delay. Regulators told Kyushu Electric the new inspection schedule seems unrealistic. Officials with the utility said they will reconsider it. All of Japan's nuclear reactors are offline. Utilities must meet new regulations introduced after the 2011 Fukushima accident to restart them. Last year, the number one and number two reactors at the Sendai plant became the first to clear them. Area residents had tried to prevent the reactors from being restarted, but this week, a district court dismissed their request. Japan's nuclear regulators continue to take steps to restart the reactors at a power plant in central Japan. They say their work will not be affected by a recent court decision blocking a restart. Officials of the Nuclear Regulation Agency met on Thursday to review progress at the number three and four reactors at Kansai Electric Power Company's Takahama plant in Fukui Prefecture. The meeting is the first about the reactors since a district court issued a provisional injunction earlier this month. Kansai Electric officials told the regulators that they will later explain the details of new facilities, which are necessary for restarting the reactors. Measures reviewed at the meeting include an earthquake-resistant seawall and a facility to serve as a base for recovery efforts in the event of an accident. The regulators accepted the utility's explanation. NRA officials say they will proceed with what screenings and inspections they can in perform while the injunction is in effect. In February, inspectors confirmed that the reactors met new regulations introduced after the 2011 Fukushima accident, but the operator cannot bring the reactors back online unless the court decision is overturned. Nuclear regulators now say the injunction will not affect administrative procedures regarding the reactors. Officials of Japan's industry ministry are trying to figure out the best mix of power sources to meet future energy needs. They've compiled a draft plan for the year 2030. It calls for reducing dependence on nuclear power to lower levels 
than before the Fukushima accident. The ministry assembled a team of experts to discuss a plan. They've been holding meetings since January. The draft says nuclear power should make up between 20 and 22 percent of Japan's total energy supply. The figure was 28 percent before the 2011 nuclear accident. Japan's dependence on thermal power has risen since then, as all nuclear reactors are offline. That's driven up fuel costs. Ministry officials decided that nuclear power is necessary to bring down prices and cut greenhouse gas emissions. The plan calls for more than doubling the percentage of energy that comes from renewable sources. Green energy accounted for a little over 10 percent of the supply in fiscal 2013. The draft suggests lifting that to between 22 and 24 percent. That means power from renewable sources would exceed that from nuclear energy. The ministry plans to present its draft plan to the experts on Tuesday next week. We've seen images of polar bears drifting on ice or water thundering from melting glaciers. These images have become symbolic of climate change. But scientists say the problems aren't just in the Arctic anymore. A violent cyclone devastated the island of Vanuatu last month. Researchers say the surface of the sea has gotten warmer, and that gave the cyclone its deadly power. World leaders have spent decades discussing how to reduce emissions of the gases that are warming our planet. They meet every year at a conference on climate change hosted by the UN. Officials from participating countries have started evaluations of possible targets to present in Paris at the end of this year. NHK World's Takafumi Terui spoke to Japan's top negotiator and asked him how Tokyo plans to contribute. Japanese leaders were expected to submit a set of targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions by March 31st. But they failed to meet the deadline. Now they say they hope to present a plan in June. I thought you'd never ask. Now, here's the finance minister, Taro Aso. Remember, everybody's an Aso. Who can forget Taro Aso? <laughs> the biggest Aso in Japan. Who can forget him? He's the finance minister, right? Yes. What an Aso that Aso is. <laughs> well, he's in this headline. Let elderly people quote, hurry up and die, says Japanese minister. Taro Aso says he would refuse end-of-life care and would feel bad knowing treatment was paid for the, by the government. So he was doing the rounds, selling people on this new budget they have you know, for the new government. Heaven forbid, he said, if you are forced to live on when you want to die, I would wake up feeling increasingly bad knowing the treatment was all being paid for by the government. The problem won't be solved unless you let them hurry up and die. <laughs> That's right, Mrs. Watanabe. This, some fellow finance minister in Japan named Aso wants you to kill yourself for the benefit of his paper-pushing bankster buddies down there at the Bank of Japan. That's not right, is it? What are you going to do about it? How about some... Uh, some you know what? They got that special sushi in Japan made out of the blowfish. <laughs> yeah. If you eat too much of it, it kills you. How about Mrs. Watanabe goes down to this asshole's office and serves him a nice luncheon of deadly sushi? How'd you like that, asshole? Atsuyuki Oike heads the government's working group on climate change. He says everyone involved knows how urgent the situation is. The warming of the climate system is unequivocal. So uh, there is a shared uh, view in the world that uh, climate change has affected uh, the lives and activities of the people worldwide. And uh, particular evidence of it may be, for example, the super typhoons, the very uh, strong torrential rains and, and drought in different places. And they, those things have affected people's lives. So uh, the global change is indeed, a, a climate change is indeed there. Trusting no objection, so decided. Thank Japan you. once played a key role in international so efforts to counter climate change. In 1997, it hosted a conference that produced the Kyoto Protocol. The framework set the mission targets for industrialized countries, developing nations, were exempted. The United States were the world's biggest emitter at the time. 
It refused to ratify it, and the protocol faltered. Leaders in Washington said they wouldn't support a treaty that didn't include the developing world. Today, China and India combined are responsible for one third of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Japanese leaders have come to believe it's time to include them and other developing nations into a new framework. Particularly,、uh, the major de- developing countries、uh, producing a lot of greenhouse gases have to be a part of、uh, the obligation system. And、uh, the reason why I'm saying this is that、uh, um, if you look at the statistics,、uh, the seven major developing countries are now. Producing almost the same amount of greenhouse gases with all developed countries、uh, together. So, this means without addressing、um, gas, greenhouse gas emissions from those developing countries,、uh, we cannot achieve our goal. The rift between industrialized and developing nations remains the focus of debate. One of the questions is how much. The richest countries should help the developing world. Oike says Japan can give more than just financial aid. He says the country has some of the world's most advanced environmental technologies. For example, in the area of、uh, transport technology, there are a lot of things going on, on the ground,、uh, like uh, the uh, Japanese steel makers、uh, working with Indian steel makers、uh, for the. Uh, you know, improvement of、uh, production facilities.、Uh, that is an、uh, that is an initiative which is going on. Negotiators will meet in Paris in December to set up a framework for regulating emissions beyond 2020. Many delegates say striking an agreement is a matter of survival for the planet's most vulnerable communities. Takahumi Terui, NHK World. Tonight's green report. We head to Hawaii. The battle for the future of renewable energy is already underway. At 12 percent, the Aloha State leads the nation in the number of homes that currently have rooftop so- solar systems. And while this is great news for the planet, not everyone is happy with Hawaii's surging solar sector. As the New York Times reported over the weekend, many of Hawaii's traditional utility companies have tried to block people from installing solar panels, saying. And according to the state of Hawaii line, that they're just not ready to handle the influx of renewable energy. Utilities have also tried to make it more expensive for solar users to send the excess power created by their panels back into the grid, making it that much less attractive to switch to solar in the first place. So, what should the battle over solar power in Hawaii tell us about the move toward a greener future? And what does this say about the importance of decentralization in the quest for renewable energy? Let's ask Adam Browning, executive director and co-founder of Vote Solar, who joins us via Skype from Oakland, California. Adam, welcome. Hey, welcome. Thanks, thanks for, th- for having me on. Sure, thanks for joining us. First, let's talk about what Hawaii is doing right. You've called Hawaii a postcard for the future when it comes to solar. Why do you say that? Well, you know, super majorities of Americans want to see this transition to renewable energy, and the radical. Premise of solar is that you don't have to wait for your utility to do it for you. You can take your matters into your own hands and do it yourself. What Hawaii shows is that when the economics are right, people will do exactly that, and that's what's happening in Hawaii right now. Yeah. And yeah. what what is it about Hawaii that put it on the top of the list in terms of solar installations? We've got places like、um, you know Arizona, where I'm guessing that there's more sun more of the time, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't. You know, you're, you're, you are right. Arizona is looking pretty good as well.、Um, but Hawaii is an island. It's a super tanker accident away from becoming Amish. A friend there likes to say. So everything has to be imported, and electricity prices are really high.、Uh, that is just makes the economics of solar so much better.、Uh, but solar's prices are coming down globally, and、uh, that's why we're getting a preview in Hawaii of what we、uh, will be seeing everywhere pretty soon. As I mentioned、uh, earlier in the setup, not everyone's thrilled with Hawaii's、uh, solar progress. Utilities seem to be fighting against it. Why is that? Look, you know, this is, change is hard. This is a major change. Utilities are used to operating in a monopoly where they get to make. They have captive customers. They make all the choices, and、uh, the customers just take what they give them.、Um, you know, 
with solar, again, we have consumers, energy users, making their own choices. And that is a real challenge to the traditional way of doing business for utilities. Do these utilities in Hawaii have a point that it's hard to integrate solar power into the existing infrastructure? I mean, they seem to be doing just a fine job of it in Germany, for example. Well, yeah, you know, this will require changes. This is uh, the system, and even more importantly than the physical system, just the, the way the utilities operate wasn't set up this way. What we're seeing really is just the pointy end of, the, of a wedge that is fundamentally changing the relationship between utilities and customers. Uh, by going solar, you're producing your own power. When you get an electric vehicle and you're plugging in, you can be in a situation where you're providing other services to the grid as well. Uh, and utilities are really just going to have to adapt to that. So um, is it different? Yes. Will it require a little work? Yes. Can it be done? Absolutely yes. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if this is a, a poster child example. Um, in about half the electricity generated in the United States is generated by uh, locally owned, not, not privately owned, but uh, community owned uh, utilities, uh, co-ops co or county owned or city owned or whatever they may be. The other half is generated by for-profit organizations. If it, it, my, my read of the two articles I've read on this that, that were fairly in-depth, uh, both seem to suggest that all the power companies in Hawaii are for profit. Um, to, uh, although that there's, there's an attempt now on one of the islands to put together a, a nonprofit co op, if, if these power companies in Hawaii were actually government agencies or not for profits, would they not be very enthusiastic about uh, a reduction in the demand for their product? Uh, whereas a for profit company gets, I mean, you know, if people buy less of your electricity, you're going to make less profit. Is that not one of the things that's at the core of this whole thing? You know, you make an excellent point here. It really is about energy choice. Who gets to choose? And the history of energy regulation in this country really has been largely about uh, giving monopolies and handing that choice over to corporations that put zero value on having a livable planet. Um, when you have a, a municipal uh, a utility, or uh, in California, there are things called the community choice aggregations, where you can set up, get a bunch of customers together, and set up a uh, a, a group to, uh, uh, to to work together to purchase your own power. Um, it uh, when when you put that choice in people's hands, they they choose solar. Um, so it's interesting in Hawaii right now. Next era mainland. A very large utility company wants to buy the Hawaiian Electric Company, and if you, you know, the other utility that Nextera owns is uh, Florida Power and Light. Now, Florida, the Sunshine State, actually has terrible solar policies and not a lot of solar, so that's really becoming a big yeah. issue. So, uh, so it's it, so it sounds like basically the policies of the state actually can direct how things go. Adam, I'm sorry we're out of town, but uh, out of time. Uh, but Adam Browning, uh, great job. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you.